Right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's session on the accessible information regulations and the support arrangements and grant available. Uh, we are recording this and I'll circulate uh, the recording and slides in the next day or so. Um, although this is a repeat of uh, other sessions which are already available on our YouTube channel, uh, which you can access immediately. Um, so we do welcome questions, so please feel free to use the chat as we go. But I will um, open up for Q&A a couple of times as we go through. Um, so uh, I'm Tim Rivett uh, and I run Artig on a day to day basis. Uh, and I've been working very closely with the Department of Transport on the development and introduction of the regulations. Um, so today we'll have a look at why the regulations have been brought in, have a quick look at the requirements in them, and then go on to what supports available. So, um, why have the regulations been introduced? Um, I'm sure when you have made a journey on bus that is unfamiliar to you, you've found yourself being more anxious than you would be on a trip you make every day. Um, so travel is a high anxiety experience, particularly for people with any form of disability. Uh, if you have a visual impairment, uh, it's even harder to know where you are than um, for somebody that's got good sight. And it's hard enough even then, um, you know, if it's dark and it's wet and all the windows are steamed up. Um, if you've got a hearing impairment, a uh, learning disability, um, pretty much any form of disability makes travel much harder. Uh, and much more anxious experience. The Guide Dogs for the Blind um, in their work on lobbying for the regulations did some work back in 2014, carried out a survey uh, of people with uh, visual impairments um, and 70% of responders said that they'd missed their stop because the driver had forgotten to tell them where to get off. Uh, understandable, drivers are human, they're going to make mistakes, they're going to forget things, um, and they've got an awful lot more to do than just remember which passenger is getting off at what stop. Um, and um, 68% of people said they would use buses more frequently if there were audiovisual announcements provided on board. Um, and that's really quite a significant statistic because people with disabilities typically only make about a third of the number of trips of any sort, public transport or otherwise, compared to people without any disability. So they're traveling much less because of the difficulties that they find. And so anything that can be done to increase the chance of making a trip and uh, and the prevalence, that is a good thing. Now, audiovisual announcements uh, are not new. If you've made a journey on a Transport for London bus, in the last 15 years, you will have seen and heard audiovisual announcements because uh, they've been in place uh, as part of the uh, IBUS 1 contract for many years. Um, if you've been on a new train, uh, all new trains since the end of the last century have had to have audiovisual announcements on vehicles. So, it's not new, the technology is fairly well understood um, and it improves the likelihood of people to make a journey and the experience for everybody. Um, so um, that's that's why it's important. Um, 
the reason that the regulations have been introduced is that um, the bus operators have been uh, not introducing audiovisual announcements as rapidly as would be liked. So um, once you take um, Transport for London buses out of the equation back in 2023, uh, less than 30% of buses in England had audiovisual announcements on. So 70% had nothing. Um, Wales and Scotland are slightly better off, um, but not significantly. And so there's a huge part of the bus market without any form of audiovisual announcements. And so the government decided to uh, regulate to ensure that there was a consistent experience uh, across all buses. So the regulations themselves, they require pretty much every local bus and coach service to provide audible announcements and visual information, uh, identifying some key bits of information. So route, stop names and things like diversions and, uh, and things like that. Um, the regulations are applicable to buses and coaches operating local services. Um, there are a few exemptions and we'll come on to those. But the key thing is operating local bus services. Now, if we go back to the 1985 Transport Act and the definition of local bus service in that, that's uh, any service where people are paying individually and you can get off within 15 miles of where you got on. So um, if you've got a rail replacement service, for example, that is operating on a local branch line um, they're paying the, uh, the the rail operator a fare and they the the stations are almost certainly going to be less than 15 miles apart so rail replacement comes in scope some coach services where the majority of the the service falls into that local bus service category will also be covered so it's not quite as simple as just going it's a registered bus service and so therefore it needs to comply the the requirements sort of expand a little bit beyond the immediately obvious uh, registered bus services so there are a number of exemptions um, if it's a small bus, sort of large minibus sort of size, 17 seats and less, um, they're exempt. Um, heritage vehicles, uh, so those used before January 73, uh, they're exempt. Uh, excursions and tours where people are going to a single destination and coming back, uh, they're exempt. Um, Closed door home to school services are exempt. Uh, if it's open door where general public can get on and pay a uh, fare, that is within scope. But closed door ones where you've got a known list of pupils, uh, they are exempt. Long distance we've talked about. Um, bits of service or the whole of a service where it's operating demand responsive, flexible, anything that's not fixed route, fixed timetable, um, they're exempt as well because you don't know where they're going to stop uh, enough in advance to be able to program systems. Um, and community bus services, uh, Section 22 uh, operators, where you they've got uh, vehicles that were used starting before October last year those vehicles are exempt but new ones aren't so there's a fair few exemptions um, and uh, sometimes you know there's a little bit of thinking to have to do um, and um, it's you know sometimes the case that a vehicle may require uh, equipping but it's not being used on the type of service that's covered and so therefore um, 
it's it doesn't need the equipment um because of the nature of services it's operating um but it would have to have the equipment if it was running a service that was within scope so you need to look at the type of operation and the vehicle as well the regulations are being brought in in a phased way um and so um vehicles that are brand new first used after october this year have to have the equipment on at first use um, vehicles that are five years old uh, have to be equipped by october this year so retrofitting uh, if vehicles 10 years old you've got until october 25 so only just over a year and the oldest vehicles up to those used uh, since January 73, you've got until October 2026. So again, just over two years, but that time will go very rapidly. Um, the key thing and the cause of quite a lot of confusion with uh, operators is it's when the vehicle was first used. So it's not when you as an operator first used it, it's when the vehicle was first used. So if you've acquired it um, from um, you know, another operator, second hand market, when did they first use it? Um, it's particularly difficult if you've got a second hand coach um, you know, that's been used on coach tours and things like that, which are exempt and you suddenly start to use it for local bus service or rail replacement, for example. Um, uh, you know, you may have a vehicle that would, you know, could be 10 years old, um, but it's never been used uh, for a local bus service. Suddenly you start using it on a local bus service. Actually, the timescales for fitting might be quite a lot shorter than you initially think. Um, where you've got vehicles uh, that have some form of audio visual equipment already on before October last year, then uh, there is the option to claim partial compliance. Uh, so uh, there's about a third of vehicles out there that may be eligible for partial compliance. Um, they have to have had audio and visual information being provided. They don't need to have some of the other things, but as long as you've got a display and audio announcements, um, they've got those vehicles have got until October 2031 to fully comply with the regulations. Um, and I'll uh, and I'll identify some of those uh, things that, that these partially compliant vehicles don't need to do. Uh, as we go along. Um, but I strongly suggest if you have a vehicle you think is partially compliant, do a full audit of its capabilities uh, and record that and keep a record of the fact that uh, it was being used uh, and before October last year and these were its capabilities. Uh, because if you're subject to inspection, uh, you'll need that to be able to justify the uh, partially compliant status uh, and in the event that you need to replace a screen or an amplifier because of a failure then uh, that vehicle will need to meet the full requirements once it's fixed and back working. Uh, so um, for the regulations you need to be providing audio announcements um, you need to provide that um, for uh, at least 51% of passengers in an intelligible way across both decks if it's a double decker um, and the way that the regulations uh, specify that it's got to be at least three decibels over the background noise so some systems have auto gain features and things like that to make sure that people don't get too blasted because uh, you know, if you think about uh, an older diesel vehicle going uphill, lots of rattles, lots of noise, 
particularly if you're sat towards the back of the vehicle, uh, you know, three decibels over background uh, on that vehicle when it's going uphill uh, is going to be quite different to um, you know three decibels above background when it's going downhill or flat. Um, there is a um, ceiling for the uh, volume, so it shouldn't be more than 84 decibels. Um, that comes from health and safety legislation, uh, where if you're um, subjecting anyone to more than 84 decibels on a regular basis, um, probably not your passengers unless they, you know, they're making an awful lot of trips. Um, but your drivers certainly would uh, fall into that category. Uh, if you're subjecting them to more than 84 decibels on a regular basis, you need to be providing uh, hearing protection. And so the last thing we want to do uh, is to need to have bus drivers with, uh, with, uh, with hearing protectors on and things like that. Um, as well as the announcements coming out over speakers, uh, you also need to provide audio induction loops uh, for those announcements. So uh, if you're not familiar with hearing loops, uh, these are uh, systems that provide the uh, audio straight into somebody's hearing aid without going through the microphone uh, on the hearing aid. And so therefore uh, you get rid of uh, pretty much all of the background noise and interference that might be around. Um, a lot of uh, banks and local authority uh, buildings have hearing loops in and you'll often uh, see the blue ear sign with a T on it to symbolise that uh, there's a hearing loop in place. Now the hearing loop needs to be provided in at least the priority and wheelchair space of uh, the vehicle don't need to uh, provide the whole uh, floor of the vehicle but if you can that would be a good thing because a lot of people that have uh, hearing aids and benefit from loops uh, don't particularly think of themselves as uh, needing a priority seat and will sit elsewhere um, but it's quite challenging to install uh, a hearing loop in a vehicle and so uh, the minimum requirement is priority and wheelchair space area and you need to tell people that the system's there so you need to put some signage in place uh, so that's the audio for the visual information you've got to have display on both decks if it's a decker um, and that display has got to be visible in an unencumbered way to 51% of seated passengers. Clearly, if you've got a bus that's full and you've got lots of standing passengers, people aren't going to be able to see the display unencumbered. So the requirement is seated passengers without anybody standing um, and got to be unencumbered so you need to think about the locations with respect to handrails which may uh, get in the way and things like that so um, it's slightly more challenging than uh, you might first think. Um, there are rules about uh, minimum character height and things like not using all capitals because uh, that makes it harder for people with visual impairments and cognitive impairments to read. Um, and there's an additional requirement for vehicles first used after October this year. And that goes for vehicles that you might have in production in a backlog at a manufacturer for delivering first use after October. Um, those are going to need to have an additional display. Well, th they're going to have to have a display that's visible to the wheelchair user when they're in a rearward facing wheelchair bay if that's how uh, they uh, are on that particular vehicle type. Um, so that probably means you need an additional display unless you can come up with a way of uh, mounting a display so that it's uh, appropriately readable for forward facing passengers and a rearward facing wheelchair user. 
um, most people are fitting a uh, an additional display um, and whilst it's a requirement for new vehicles um, we are seeing some of the larger operators uh, retrofitting uh, that additional display on existing vehicles so that's technically what you need to provide um, the information that you need to provide, you need to provide route information. Uh, as somebody is boarding, they need to be uh, provided with route information. So route number or name uh, and its direction. Um, and uh, if it's a circular service, for example, the direction round that it's going, uh, basically enough information for them to know that they're on the bus the right bus route going in the right direction. Um, and at the end of the route, you need to wake passengers up with an alert uh, and tell them that it's the last stop. Um, when the vehicle is traveling along its route, um, you need to provide information about each stop. Doesn't matter whether you stop there or not, the next stop still needs to be announced because somebody might want to get off there. Um, the timing of that announcement needs a bit of thought um, because if you've got a uh, short distance between uh, stops, you need to be uh, making that announcement probably as soon as the bus starts to move because passenger needs enough time to go, aha, I've heard or seen that stop announcement. Um, that's the one I want, find the bell push and the driver come to a safe stop without needing to do an emergency stop. Uh, you know, so in an urban environment with frequent stops, you know, you're gonna need to be making that announcement pretty quickly after the, the previous stop. Uh, but if you're in a rural area, with you know stops in each village and villages are a couple of kilometers apart then you probably don't want that announcement as you leave the last stop the previous stop you want that closer to the next stop because what you don't want people to do is aha that's the stop i want press the button stand up and go to the front of the bus and there's still a couple of minutes of journey around twisty roads where they're standing up and at risk of, uh, of falling and injury. So you need to think about the timing of announcements. Um, if you're in Wales or providing systems to Wales, then the Welsh Language Act does apply. And so you need to provide uh, dual language announcements. Um, there is a ongoing set of discussions with the Welsh Government, Transport for Wales and operators about making that work. Uh, if you want to get involved in those conversations, then let me know um, and I can make the, uh, the necessary introductions. Um, the name of the stop that is used should be consistent across different uh, customer outputs. So if somebody has planned a journey online or on an app, the stop name that they've seen on that should be the same as the uh, name of the, the the stop physically, you know, on the plate and time printed timetables and things like that, and consistent with the name that's announced. Um, you know, there's quite a lot of debate between operators and authorities sometimes or between different operators about what a name of a stop is. Um, uh, with this expectation that consistency is used, um, those discussions sort of need to become quite focused quite quickly to get some consistency. Uh, my suggestion is that that's something that would be really interesting and useful place to, you know, set of discussions to take to an enhanced partnership where you've got everybody sat around the table um, in a cooperative manner. Um, so that's the fundamental core information that needs to be provided. Um, if you're operating hail and ride sections of route, then you need to, in addition, uh, alert people. 
that hail and ride section is starting and ending and um it's not mandated but where a hail and ride section is lengthy then uh, additional um information you know contextual information will be really useful to help people understand where they are um and therefore where they may want to get off so you know crossroads along the section or get when you're going through village or something like that that additional contextual information will help people know where they are and where to uh, where they want to get off um and um probably the hardest uh, bit of information to get right is diversion information so where a vehicle leaves its planned route um passengers need to be alerted and uh, told that the vehicle is going uh, off its planned route and when it gets back onto the route uh, that also needs to be uh, announced now uh, in some cases uh, you know that's not planned you know you'll turn a corner and you find the police have uh, closed the road for whatever reason and so you just need to do an ad hoc diversion um systems aren't going to know about that in advance and so therefore practically there's got to be a way for the driver to uh, trigger that announcement um historically you might have only updated route information uh if there's a diversion that's planned you know for more than four or five months you know you update the registration update data to bods and travel line and things like that um, but with this requirement to announce the diversion, uh, uh, you might want to think about you know, if you've got a couple of weeks of a diversion, actually reprogramming the system, updating journey planners and things like that. So the driver doesn't have to intervene and do something because they've got enough to go on with when they're trying to you know, uh, get on a diversion and navigate around it. Uh, so think about how often you update some of your route information uh, so that actually you know, it's not a diversion anymore or it is a diversion, but the system's programmed to deal with it. Um, these systems aren't just um, fit and forget. You are going to need to maintain them. Um, and have processes in place to make sure that uh, they're working. Um, uh, it's quite easy for a driver to know or an engineer to know whether uh, announcements are coming across speakers because you can quite easily hear it. Um, it's quite easy to have a quick look at a display screen and see that it's working. Um, what is much less easy to know is working properly is a hearing loop uh, unless you've got a hearing aid with a t-switch yourself uh, uh, the best that you're going to be able to do uh, is look at an led that some of the system hearing loop systems have got that says whether technically it's doing what it needs to do um, but what that doesn't tell you is actually whether the audio that's being presented is intelligible whether it's got interference and things like that and so uh, the recommendation is to uh, get hold of a tester um, less than 100 quid little black box receiver that pretends it's a hearing aid with a t-switch on you plug a set of headphones in and you can listen in to what's coming out over the hearing loop now you're not going to need to do that every day, but you're going to want to be doing that on a fairly regular basis, you know, weekly, ideally, perhaps, you know, you get away with a, a monthly part of a monthly, you know, MOT type check, that sort of thing. Um, but you are going to need to uh, check that the hearing loop is working on a regular basis. Um, you probably don't as an operator get many um customer complaints about information and things not working on a bus and things like that experience is though that once you've got audio visual announcements uh, passengers really quickly notice if you know there's a stop missing or you've got an extra stop the route's not quite right 
uh, if they don't like the way that a stop is pronounced, you know, they're going to be quite readily coming forward to drivers to, to make a comment. Um, you're going to need a way of capturing that and feeding that back to uh, you know, depots and back offices to get fixed. Um, and so think about how a driver is going to record that and pass that back. Think about your other forms of customer engagement and how you're going to process comments and, and feedback that you receive through those. Um, so uh, think about that whole maintenance bit. So that's a quick run through the regulations. Has anybody got any questions about those? No, OK. Um, so I'm um, going to talk about the support available whenever a government introduces a new regulation or law, they have to carry out an impact assessment to understand uh, what parts of society or industry are going to benefit from a bit of legislation or where they're going to be adversely impacted, understand the financial human impact. Um, as part of the process of introducing these regulations, an impact assessment was carried out and it identified that smallest bus operators were going to be uh, adversely impacted by the introduction of the regulations, particularly financially. Uh, you know, if you're a big group operator and you've got a thousand buses or you're, you know, you've got a hundred buses and you go to a supplier and go, I need a hundred or a thousand units, please. Uh, they're probably going to give you a reasonable price and give you a bit of a discount for volume. If you've got two buses, then you're going to be paying the, uh, the, you know, the rack published rate. Um, and therefore costing you more. Um, you need tools to manage the route information and keep it up to date, whether you've got one bus or a thousand buses. Um, and so therefore, you know, if you've a small operator, you need things um, and you're going to be charged potentially more than the large operator will be. Um, so to help mitigate that um, and encourage operators to fit equipment and meet the regulations earlier than they may have done otherwise. You know, typically a small operator will be running uh, you know, older vehicles, got a couple of years to meet the requirements and that, you know, that sort of situation. Um, how can we encourage uh, them to fit equipment and passengers to get benefit earlier than they would otherwise? Um, so uh, the grant tackles the, uh, the the adverse financial impact and also encourages earlier fitting. Um, so um, Department of Transport asked uh, Artig because of our work with them over uh, many years uh, to manage on the department's behalf a grant of uh, just over four and a half million pounds to help the smallest operators with the cost of uh, fitting. So um, when we talk about smallest operators, we're talking about 20 or fewer in scope vehicles. Um, uh, you might have a few more. You might have some mini buses which are out of scope of the regs. Um, but you know, 20 vehicles isn't that many. You're not going to be that big an operator. If you're part of a group, um, it's the group that we look at. And so, you know, you're probably going to have too many vehicles in that case. The vehicle itself has got to be in scope of the regulations. It's got to be being used on an in scope uh, type of service. Um, and uh, you can't have uh, audio and visual equipment on board already. Um, applications need to come directly from the operator. We've deliberately tried to make the process as simple as possible. Um, you know, uh, not need consultants and authorities to, to write war and peace and, and 
the sort of things that you might have come across in other government grants and funding streams. Uh, this is really simple. Um, you can use the grant to buy equipment if you need speakers, hearing loops, and displays. You know, sometimes vehicles that might have uh, displays and not do audio. You know, so uh, you know different operators are going to need different uh, kit or an amounts of kit um, to make sure the grant goes as far as possible it will only fund the minimum specification necessary to meet the regulations so the grant won't fund you know surround sound audio and a 70 inch plasma 3d screen in the bus uh, it will fund you know basic audio pa system it will fund um an led display which is practically the minimum uh that you're going to need to meet the requirements um if you want something more than the minimum you know you might decide you want tft because you can provide other information you know, perhaps we might be able to get some revenue in from from an advertiser that sort of thing then that's perfectly fine get a quote for what you really want, get a quote for minimum spec LED and things like that. Uh, the grant will pay out for the minimum spec. You just top it up till uh, you get what you really want. Um, you can use it for installation. Whilst a lot of the time installation will come as part of a package from a supplier, there is uh, a bit of a uh, crunch with suppliers at the moment needing to fit an awful lot of equipment and so you know they've got kit waiting in a warehouse for installation but they haven't got enough engineers so you might need to look elsewhere for installation or get your engineers trained up um if you need supporting infrastructure to manage you know the, the keep the routes up to date and things like that for the displays um, an audio then fund that and it'll fund a year's worth of maintenance although most of them seem to be coming with two or three years uh, as part of the uh, of the deal um, I've said the process is as simple as possible um, you need a quote from a supplier we're not asking for multiple quotes um, we are looking at the quotes that people have got coming into us as part of the process um, and uh, if your quote looks significantly different to uh, what's coming in on average then we are going back to people going you might want to have another think about uh, a different supplier because this one seems to be uh, overcharging uh, or perhaps somebody's got particularly unique vehicle with particular difficulties with fitting or something like that. So we're trying to understand where there are differences, but so far uh, they're all pretty much of a muchness. Um, there's a grant claim form, um, pretty simple information needed there. Hopefully you know it. If you don't, I'm a bit worried because it's things like what's your company name, what's your bank account details, what's your operating oh, license, that sort of thing, stuff that you should have readily to hand. Um, the bit where you might need to get some additional assistance uh, is the subsidy self-certification form. So this grant is classed as state aid to your organisation. Um, and there are rules about how much state aid uh, an organisation can get in a three year period. Uh, and so you might need to talk to an accountant to uh, work through what other financial support you've had from the public sector over the last three years to uh, to work out uh, what your totals are. Because what we don't want to do is uh, cause you problems by uh giving you too much uh you know state aid and therefore uh come into uh problems as a result and we don't want to uh get into trouble for uh for breaching rules either um and then there's a set of terms and conditions as you'd expect there are certain obligations 
Uh, there we've tried to keep them to a minimum and as simple as possible, but you need to keep kit on the bus and, and look after it for five years. Um, uh, if you get rid of a bus uh, and replace it, then either move the kit from one vehicle to another or make sure the new vehicles uh, comes fitted um, and uh, we will be carrying out uh, checks and asking you to, to evidence. Uh, that the kit is still working over the next five years uh, and we will have somebody that will uh, go around and do some uh, physical spot checks as well. But pretty simple process, not war and peace and as complex as uh, as you might have seen from previous government processes. Um, in terms of timescales, originally uh, the applications were going to close on the 3rd of June. Uh, we have uh, extended that application period um, and uh, it will stay open for as long as uh, there is money left in the grant uh, and we haven't got uh, bids in for the total. Um, so um, if you go, oh, all our vehicles are you know, eight years old and therefore don't need to be fitted until uh, October next year, so we'll apply, you know, next spring because that will give us enough time to, to get fitted and things like that, then please don't wait because by then uh, all the money will have been allocated. Part of the aims of this grant, as I said, uh, is to get people fitting vehicles earlier and passengers getting the benefit earlier than they would otherwise have done. Um, we are also not expecting another grant next year or the year after. Uh, every indication is that this is a one stop, uh, you know, uh, single shot grant. Um, so uh, don't think, oh, I'll apply next time around um, because uh, there isn't going to be a next time round. So um, get the applications in early. Um, if you applied before Monday this week um, before the original deadline, um, you will know uh, what you got um, by sort of the end of the month, early July. Um, if you apply afterwards, then once we've done the initial tranche of applications, uh, we will uh, be letting people know on a rolling basis based on uh, when they applied. But we are keeping an eye on uh, what's coming in, so uh, so we know when we've uh, when we've got to the point uh, of uh, enough applications to uh, use all the grant, because we do want to get rid of all of this money. Uh, we don't want any left at the end of it, uh, so we do want to uh, give it away. Uh, we don't need to worry about that one anymore. Um, if you need more information about the regulations and the grant, uh, we've got a set of pages on the RTG website with uh, links to the legislation, guidance, uh, advice, um, and uh, how to apply for the grant, you know, what the, the links are and, and links to all the documentation that you need to fill out. Um, if you've got questions, we've got a dedicated email address and the team getting back to people uh, in a couple of hours. Um, we're not hanging around and leaving you waiting for days on this one. Um, if you have never used any of these sort of systems before, you know nothing about them, then we've got a report available that looks at the different technologies um, out there and some of the things that you need to be aware of. So some of the things that you might want to think about when you're planning in implementations um, and some things that you're going to need to do to, uh, to keep this stuff working. So maintenance stuff and things like that. So uh, that's the grant and the support available. I should also say um, if you're members of CPT or Album, we're then feel free to talk to them. Album, uh, CPT, for example, as part of their compliance manual, uh, they've got a lot of information uh, that we've been uh, helping them put together in the compliance manual. Um, they've got videos and things like that um, as well. Uh, and Album have got uh, some information as well. 
Uh, so if your members are there, talk to them if you want. Talk to us if you want. Um, we're here to help. Um, any questions about the grant and support? Hey Tim, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Good. Sorry, I should have asked this a question earlier, uh, and it's not to do with the grant. It's That's more fine. to do with the October deadline. Given the limited number of suppliers who obviously can do the fitting uh, of the AVA, is the first of October a drop deadline? Dead deadline? Will we get in trouble if we can't make that deadline? Or do you have to show that you're actually making progress? Uh, so there's no indication that there's going to be generic exclusions and um, extensions like there were with PSVAR. Um, so um, what the department has said is where there are particular mitigating circumstances, um, if you talk to them, um, then um, you may be able to get one, but they're not planning to give many out because people have had 18 months to do things. Um, and um, you know, if you talk to suppliers um, and the DFT have been quite a lot over the last year or so, um, until a couple of months ago, they were going, it's really quiet. You know, we normally get more orders than we're getting now, and we know there's a deadline <laughs> coming. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, supplies, yeah, they've become really busy suddenly, but the DFT's view, certainly at the moment, is people have sat on their, you know, uh, seats for too long and, and left it too late. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, any more? No. OK, in which case, um, if you do think of something afterwards, uh, feel free to uh, drop me a line, drop the uh, AIG mailbox uh, a quick line uh, and uh, we're happy to help. Um, so um, I will say uh, thank you for your time this afternoon and have a good rest of the day. Thanks, Tim. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.